And this was the very first time since moving to the UK in early 2016 that I actually thought my life or the life of somebody that I love might be directly threatened by Islamists. My guest today is Khalid Hassan, a political risk and intelligence analyst whose research looks at anti-Semitism, Islamism and conspiracy theories. Khalid, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. I'm well. Thanks. Love Good. You. So, Khalid, you were born in Egypt um, as, as a non-Jew and now you're a Jew living in the UK. Quite a change, no? Yes. <laughs> 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 and yeah, I mean this this is like this is a fascinating story. I was wondering if you could tell tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, thanks very much. It's actually I think it's very relevant to our discussion today. Uh, so I am a researcher. This is what I do for a living, basically. Uh, and I think my story goes to a stage in my life where I was pretty much radicalizing in a way. Radicalized. I was never an Islamist, so I never believed that Islamism, in the sense that political Islam, is is, is of any value to me in my life, to be perfectly honest. Uh, so I was actually going in the other direction, if you will. Uh, just to clarify this, so I think uh, usually when we say somebody is radicalizing, we don't really understand what it means. We think it's just necessarily just something bad. It's not always something bad, actually. Uh, a radical is just somebody who believes in views that are uncommon where they are within their own environment uh, and it always begins with this sense of grievance you always feel that something is wrong and you need to right this wrong and this is when you start to find answers to questions that you have uh, so this is precisely what happened to me when i was a teenager i just started asking questions uh, i started asking questions about the whole is arab israeli conflict about why things are the way they are in uh, the Arabic-speaking world. I never considered myself an Arab as well. I always considered myself an Egyptian. Because I believe it's very much similar to asking somebody who is um, Scottish whether they believe they're English. No, of course they don't. <laughs> yes, they may speak English, they may, you know, be part of the UK, but they're not English. You wouldn't tell you I'm English. Famously, they hate they hate being asked if they're English. Yes, exactly. Yes, so it's. Uh, it, it, I I always get the same. I always give the same reaction if somebody says to me, "You're an Arab." No, I'm Egyptian, and uh, the yeah. fact that we were occupied by Arabs and now we speak Arabic is is just very different. It's like somebody in parts of West Africa who speaks French it doesn't make them French. Uh, so that's my journey. I mean, I started questioning all of these beliefs around me when I was a teenager and decided, you know what, I'm not going to inherit, inherit any faith or I'm not going to inherit any beliefs. I will just find the beliefs that suit me. And I was a teenager and it really took years. I mean, I examined uh, Christianity and I, I, I love the Egyptian uh, Coptic church. I examined different faiths and just eventually made the decision, you know what, Judaism is right for me. Uh, so that's basically it, yeah, very, very quickly. And I was very fortunate because I also spoke English because I was well educated. So I had access while living in Egypt to actually a lot of researchers in mo mostly in the US. And I have a very good friend of mine in the US who was pretty much my mentor in all this. And I think I, uh, I owe him so much basically. That's lovely. And and what I, what I want to know is, is growing up in Egypt, what was your uh, impression of Jewish people? You see, this is, this is actually one of the most difficult questions uh, to answer. Not necessarily because I don't know how to describe it, but because I don't really, I want to explain to somebody who, you know, was born in London, was born somewhere in, you know, in Europe or in the US, uh, how it actually works. Uh, so I think... The best way to put it, I've come to this conclusion that imagine you find out that your neighbor did something so hideous and horrible that the whole community just hates them. The whole community wants to avoid them because obviously any association with them would actually also put you in scrutiny and people would question you, they would question your convictions. 
Sadly, this is how views, how, how Jews are viewed in the Middle East, uh, in Egypt and the Arabic speaking world. It's, it's this group of people who are fundamentally evil, who are fundamentally horrible in a way. And that's why nobody is even, is even willing to consider Israeli or Hebrew, uh, literature or even a book. You know, everyone is terrified of even touching one simple book. You know, even the Torah is, you know, it's, it's, so that is really the perception that we've had. It's it's one of suspicion, of fear, or you know, just a mix of fear in someone being you know suspicious of them, and obviously thinking that they are inherently evil. Uh, so that's that's yeah. the impression we had, unfortunately, and education does reinforce it. So so you grew up in this environment, and presumably you also believe that you know Jews were evil you had your suspicions how did you then change this what was the moment when you were like oh actually I, this might not be right well the thing is I was very different from from an early stage because I loved tourism I loved seeing people from different places I loved I loved America also unlike a lot of <laughs> a lot of a lot of Egyptians I loved America I loved the idea of of, of American rights. So I was very, I had this, again, in radicalization, we call something a cognitive opening. So it's this willingness to actually listen. It's this willingness to actually hear that information. Uh, so for me, it all started when I just started examining uh, where I want to study. As, as a teenager, I just wanted to study somewhere where I can actually view these, these, these ideas. And that was always the US. Uh, so I would say this was really probably the changing point for me when I was around 15, 16. I just started examining all this. Uh, and one of the key one of the key changing or turning points for me was definitely my involvement in uh, peace talks between Jordanians, Palestinians, Egyptians, and Israelis. Because uh, I was very fortunate to be involved in some of these discussions, uh, organized on a grassroots level, basically. Well, a lot of what you've been saying about radicalization, the, a lot of the rhetoric, it seems to be not too dissimilar from conspiracy theorists and how they get indoctrinated. And this is also something that you look at in your work. You cover conspiracy theorists. And I think people find conspiracy theorists both fascinating and scary because sometimes they can present as so outlandishly ridiculous while other times they pose the very real threat of radicalization and in fact the mainstream often dismisses conspiracy theories as being ridiculous which means that we don't appreciate the radicalizing effect that they have on people which conspiracy theories stand out to you as particularly dangerous well, it's most definitely uh, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, this uh, originally Russian publication, and it's 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 just yeah. it's just spread everywhere like wildfire. Can, I think can you explain what that is for those who don't know? Yes, so the Protocols of the Elders of Zion is basically a document that, in a way, um, alleges that there is this group of Jews who pretty much dominate or want to dominate the world and want to destroy the world and want things to go their way and there's obviously the financial aspect to it uh, which I think we, we all are to a degree aware of it somehow uh, the Zionist lobbying, the Rothschilds you know, <laughs> all this you know, Jews yeah. controlling the world, so it's very very uh, common sadly and it's 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 very commonplace in, in many different I would probably say there isn't one country that doesn't have a number of people who believe in this specific uh, conspiracy theory. Right. And, and I would just add that this originated in the early 1900s in, in Europe, and it made its way across the world, significantly influencing anti-Semitism in the Arab-speaking world. But also further than that, there, there are reports in of... of um, high figures in Japan uh, on who, who, are, who are influenced by this, which is something that Dara Horn mentions, a previous guest of ours, on her podcast, which is very interesting. And um, so so the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, it was written approximately about 100 years ago. How are we still seeing this today, Khaled? Well, that's the problem. It's uh, it's very much a cultural thing. It's, it's very much part of the cultural fabric of Arab societies to 
not even question the protocols of their design because if you do question this and say, hold on, I don't think this is actually reasonable or I don't think that this actually makes sense, then you yourself are actually blamed as one of the pretty much people who are representing this this conspiracy theory or people who actually do promote it, uh, promote well promote Jewish control of of, of the world really. So it, it found its way to uh, the Arab world, unfortunately. Uh, I'd probably say during the early stages of the establishment of the state of Israel, that's when it really became very popular. And until now, it's actually printed. It's legally printed. It's you know people just read it like it's you know it's it's a very average document, and it's uh, <laughs> it's yeah. It's I'd, I'd give it a two and a half out of five. It's very average. Yes, yes, uh, but it's that's that's why it's really quite it's awfully common. I mean, I would like to actually also explain a couple of things on conspiracy theories. Uh, Please, it's, it's also very related to the idea of one of the main reasons this is very commonplace is it's related to the concept that Jews are spreading Judaism. They want to entirely it's the Judaization of the Middle East. There is this concept that Jews want to turn territory and people into Jews, etc., etc., which is, again, really quite horrific. It's, it has no basis whatsoever because you will never find a mosque that was a mosque that was later turned into a synagogue. It just doesn't exist. I do not know of one such uh, building. And on the other hand, you will find a lot of churches that were turned into uh, mosques. You find a lot of synagogues that were turned into mosques, including several that my 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 friend, my good friend Lynn Julius, actually mentions in her book uh, Uprooted, which basically explains how Jews were pretty much uh, another podcast uh, guest, by the way. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yes, she's absolutely wonderful. So again, you know, it's so yeah. this has no basis whatsoever, uh, but it's people just yeah. love it. They they do, and it's also sort of. Funny, but not really funny, because again, famously, as as you can testify, we make it very hard to convert. We make it quite a laborious process. So the idea is that we're somehow trying to uh, turn the world Jewish really sort of goes against the tenets yes. of Judaism. Yes. Well, that's the thing. It's, uh, I mean, Judaism is, so if we look at the three Abrahamic faiths, which is you know, Christianity, Islam, Judaism. Judaism is the only one that is not missionary in any ways or forms. You will never see Jews going around the world trying to spread Judaism. Obviously, there are very extreme and rare examples, uh, but they've always been, again, very sidelined and very, very rare in Judaism. On the other hand, yeah. you'll find that everyone, in every, every sheikh, every imam, every uh, priest, you also, I mean, it's actually really quite, quite, Incredible how you see it in Oxford, for instance. Oxford is a city known for a lot of intellectual rights. You will always find, I always found, because I lived there for a couple of years, uh, if you just walk down the high street during the weekend, you'll always find a Muslim and a Christian preacher. Both of them are trying to convince people to actually accept their faith. <laughs> and you will never find as you're doing this. And it's, 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 it's just very obvious. Yeah. 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 Um, and I, I think a very interesting, I think going back to conspiracy theories, I think a conspiracy theory that has really made its way around the world in recent years is the uh, conspiracy theory about COVID-19. Now I say the conspiracy theory about COVID-19, there are, there are many. Um, and, and, and within these conspiracy theories, a lot of them have anti-Semitic rhetoric. You know, at the start, we sort of started seeing this, it's the Jews sort of perpetrating COVID, um, which, you know, I s still carries on this conspiracy theory. We've seen incidents in America, uh, the group, uh, the Goyim Defense League, they've distributed flyers to homes across the country in America that says COVID-19 is a Jewish agenda. Um, and, and we've also seen at protests seeming apparently more moderate people, but still wearing uh, yellow stars that Jews were forced to wear in the concentration camps to to imply that this is a, a, a fascist regime, the lockdown restrictions and so forth. Um, why do you think in, in some form or another, 
we have just seen so much anti-Semitic uh, imagery and symbolism surrounding COVID? It's actually, I think it's a very good question. And it's also related to why these conspiracy theories just spread like wildfire, like we said. Uh, it's it's academically speaking, it's a very it's it's a growing discipline. So we haven't been studying why people actually believe in these ideas for a very long time. Uh, but a researcher, Karen Douglas, for instance, and her colleagues wrote an excellent paper on this, and they explain, which I think we have seen during again the same protests and the same incidents related to COVID, that conspiracy theories are universal. So they're everywhere. They find their way somehow everywhere. And they always happen when some community perceives a threat. So when you believe that you're under threat, when you believe that, right, it's now my livelihood, it's now my job on the line, it's now my kids, it's now extra, extra, you know, it's, 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 you start to actually believe in conspiracy theories because you need to believe that something is wrong and somebody's behind it. Uh, so that's why it's really, it really gets, to be far more successful in communities like you know like Egypt who believe that right Israel might just occupy us at any given time. So it's this feeling that you're under threat that makes you uh, more again having this cognitive opening and actually being more willing to accept these mad ideas. So I believe this is why it happened. Unfortunately, Jews have been historically blamed, and I'm talking about thousands of years. I'm not talking about hundred years, or I'm not talking about even uh, even you know a few decades. We're talking about really thousands of years. So we've always seen it, and it just happened again. And this time, it happened right at our doorstep because Jews are always blamed. And when everyone was feeling under threat, a group of people decided to blame the Jews, as is always the case. And and it took off. Um, and what's interesting is that this one did take off, but not all of them do. You know, for example, if we look at the anti-Semitic conspiracy theorist David Icke, on the extreme end, he will have some wild theories that some people of the human race are actually reptiles and, and lizards. And that is clearly ridiculous. And I assume a very small, I would hope a very small percentage of people believe it. And I think they do. Um, it, you know, but on the other end, you have conspiracy theorists, conspiracy theories that do take off, such as COVID nineteen is being masterminded, uh, where that where a bigger group of people buy into that. And I want to know why do you think that some conspiracy theories take off and others don't? What makes a successful conspiracy theory? Again, I think what makes a successful conspiracy theory is is this basically cultural base for it there is an audience that is willing to accept it for many reasons, including the fact that they do feel under threat. So we've been fortunate living here in, in Europe and in the UK because we have this, uh, we have a lot of basically social care initiatives. We have a lot of, you know, the furlough schemes. So we have a lot of uh, basically uh, communal and, and government initiatives to fall back on if something actually does happen to you. In many places, like in the Middle East, you just don't have this. Uh, so that's why a lot of a lot of conspiracy theories do succeed. And also, you have to understand that if it's really reinforced by the government, if the government actually promotes this for political reasons, then that's an entirely different question. Uh, we had here our ministers obviously saying this is madness. You know that you blame Jews for this, or you blaming anyone else, and the whole you know COVID conspiracy theories was was were entirely dismissed. Unfortunately, if you look at other countries, that is not the case. They were actually accepted and promoted by certain governments for certain political interests. So I think this is why you'll find that, you know, different conspiracy theories just really go far and become very commonplace within a community, uh, while others just really don't. Uh, but I do believe that, like you said, we do dismiss how consequential they are, actually. Which again, the same the same point, uh, the same report I mentioned and the same study I mentioned does really highlight this. Conspiracy theories are consequential. It's not something that will have no effect. It may have a huge effect, like in Egypt, where you know basically it's it's an environment. Well, not just Egypt, the entire Arab world, where it's an environment where Jews are not safe to even walk, you know, and just do a bit of shopping. <laughs> uh, yeah. Or it might have, you know. 
some, you know, like we've seen in London, basically, you know, traffic congestion just because some people who believe that there is a conspiracy theory just decided to protest. Um, yeah, that's the most British conspiracy theory I could possibly imagine. <laughs> like that traffic congestion <laughs> is being masterminded. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's you'll find, you know, it's again, it's very different. But I think we need to have resilience as a community. We need to have resilience to actually combat these theories because they can spread, and we do not know what effect they may have until sometimes it's really too late. Right. Right. Now, now, say someone's uh, friend or loved one buys into a conspiracy theory, which has happened a lot over the past two years or so with COVID. Um, this has been an unfortunate thing that we've seen. So say, so, you know, a loved one or friend is, is buying into a conspiracy theory. How do they pull them out of it? That's actually a very interesting and difficult question, because I have friends of mine who support a certain very senior politician who is known now for being quite anti-Semitic. I'm not sure if I should mention his name. Uh, <laughs> But I think it's Jerry Corbyn. Uh, yes, exactly. Yes. That's fine. Uh, yes. uh, so I've seen. I'll, I'll use this example to actually really just you know answer this question. Uh, sadly, a lot of people do still support him. If you go back to some of his early interviews, he was once interviewed by the Iranian TV, uh, and he actually said that he believes. I believe it was 2012. Uh, the terrorist attack against uh, military personnel in Sinai was actually carried out by Israel and that they are behind it. Sadly, this was entirely uh, baseless. No one, no one in Egypt, I was living in Egypt back then, no one believed that, oh, it's the Jews who actually carried this, out this attack. Not because, obviously, you know, people are not anti-Semitic, but because people did believe that Islamism was the threat that we're dealing with at the moment. It was, you know, these were very turbulent times for Egypt, and we had a lot of terrorists released from prison, and it was, you know, it was just obvious who was behind it. So even in Egypt, nobody believed this. But here you had somebody who was, you know, who was very close to being prime minister in, in the UK, who actually believed this conspiracy theory and promoted it. And you still have people who believe in him. I think I'd be lying to you if I said how we can actually, if I said that I know the answer to this question, how we can actually pull someone out of this. Uh, but I believe that what we need to do is again dismantle this this conspiracy theory in many different ways and make sure that this community does not feel under threat. So again, we had the COVID stuff, people felt like, right, our liberties and our livelihoods are threatened. And that's why they were very uh, willing to accept these theories. We need to just make sure that again, they have the resilience against this perceived threat. So they don't feel, you know, again, uh, the need to believe in these theories. I believe this is the very first step. You know, we need to understand that this is, we need to understand that this is something that governments are responsible for. We need to promote awareness and education around this. Yeah. Yeah. Have, have you noticed a difference in uh, the popularity of conspiracy theories between the Western world and uh, the, 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 the Middle East? And, and if so, what, which ones would be more popular aware? Oh, yes. I mean, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories in, in the Arab world are so common, like I said, that just, you just don't question it. Here in the West, I think we're quite fortunate that we have this, again, degree of resilience, just because community, you know, generally, uh, is just more resilient to these ideas. And I also believe because we have the European experience with Nazism, which was a horrible conspiracy theory in many ways, that obviously yeah. was very consequential, so a lot of people know where this can lead. Sadly, in the Middle East, in the Arab world, actually, there is very, very, very little education on uh, the Holocaust. So people still believe that, you know, there is a lot of... Actually, not only that. We've had, during the protests against the Lady of Heaven, we've had a lot of Islamist preachers saying, you know what, we need our freedom of expression to criticize the Holocaust and say that the story you're promoting around the Holocaust is not true in an indication that, you know, they're being targeted explicitly uh, if they deny the Holocaust or basically uh, claim that it never happened or, you know, question it in one way or, or, or another. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, as as we as we've said, you 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 are an Arabic speaker, um, but not an Arab uh, or Scottish. And I want to know: do you do you feel that this gives you an insight into the Arab world that most Western Jews or, or Westerners in general lack? Yes, I totally believe this because it's uh, it's. I grew up in this community, so it's very much part of who I am in a way. I really know the insides of this, and I know how how your own mindset is actually formed and shaped over the years of education. You know, where you don't actually have. I was never taught about the history of of Egyptian Jews, or you know how how they lived in Egypt, although they are very much part of that history. Uh, the same can be said about a lot of ethnic and religious minorities, by the way. But Jews are explicitly. And uh, especially targeted. Yeah, I. Um, I mean, I, I assume a lot of this, this, uh, the, these thoughts about Jews come from the the media and the way that Arabic, uh, Arab media portrays Jews. How, how would what would you say that portrayal looks like? And, and would it be in TV or films or books? So it's 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 everywhere. It really is everywhere. So I'll mention an example that actually is very personal to me. So I grew up watching, you know, different films by, you know, very popular Egyptian comedians. And I love these films because, you know, it's part of my childhood. I laughed at these films, you know, it was, and I had a wonderful childhood. Now when I watch these films, I notice things that I did not notice previously as a child. Like when I just, you know, you know, hey, when I just look at it, I just like, this is horribly anti-Semitic. I can't let my daughter now watch this. Wow. Uh, Exactly. So it's 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 really everywhere. What uh, sort of thing do you think would would slip past a child, but an adult would be like, "Hang on, what's this?" Well, you have a lot of you know, just the representation of a Jew. Obviously, you have the nose. Obviously, you have how they talk. You know, so they're always portrayed. Jews generally are always portrayed in in, in Arab media, like you know, talking in a very specific tone of voice. And saying certain words that others do not say. For instance, saying an, an Arabic word called Azizi. Yeah, Azizi. So it's, that means my dear. So nobody really uses that word in Egypt, but it's like, oh, I'm trying to make you feel like I'm close to you. I'm your friend. So that I can go ahead and then backstab you. Oh, so sneaky. Always, like they're yes, plotting. Yes, exactly. So always sly, always sneaky, always plotting, you know. Oh, right. talking in a very calm tone of voice. And then, you know, in a way you find that, oh, this person just backstabbed you. So, you know, this yeah. is the build-up of events. Uh, so obviously, if you see somebody talking and saying to somebody, oh, my dear, you know, you wouldn't really say this is, oh, this is anti-Semitic, unless you know the whole picture. Yeah. So that's why it's really wired into your mindset. That Jews are sly, you know, they're just this kind of person that you should avoid. Because even yeah. if they're trying to be nice to you and actually doing good things, they're still inherently evil. Yeah. D does this um does this portrayal ever vary in the Arabic world from country to country? Like, for example, would 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 uh Egypt's portrayal of Jews, you know, they look like this, but in Yemen they look like that and they talk like this, or is it the same everywhere? Now, I would probably say it's the same everywhere. You have different uh, and very rare exceptions. So now you have, you know, Saudi Arabia, for instance, there was a certain production that was actually very positive of Jews. Uh, it was a TV series, which is, you know, very, very, very rare. But even this is actually perceived as, all right, this is part of the Zionist conspiracy, you know, to have Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince in Saudi Arabia, take over because... He's actually Jewish. And then President Sisi, his mom is Jewish. And he too is, you know, this is why he's renovating synagogues. So it's sadly, it's largely still perceived as part of a Zionist conspiracy. Not as not as not as any effort to actually just show you the real Jew, you know, show you how Jews are. No, it's still anything that shows Jews in a positive light is still entirely dismissed. Mm. Yeah. I, there's there's probably very little chance of this podcast taking off in Egypt, I suppose, but that's fair enough. Uh, yeah. So, so I mean, look, it's worth pointing out that in addition to to anti-Semitism in in Arab countries, there's there's also been instances of anti-Semitic rhetoric being found in uh, Arabic-speaking outlets across yeah. the world, including here 
right? So, so for example, uh, supporters of campaign against anti-Semitism may be familiar with our complaint against the BBC Arabic journalist Tala Halawa, who tweeted that Hitler was right and that Israel is more Nazi than Hitler. Uh, the BBC then confirmed that Ms. Halawa was no longer working with the organization after our complaint. There was also the activist Muna Hawa, who was reportedly suspended by Al Jazeera and Twitter after she created and shared a video that asked, how true is the Holocaust and how did the Zionists benefit from it? And her return to Twitter was praised by... BBC Arabic journalist Leila Bashar Al Koub, who, who who praised Miss Hawa's quote victory of exquisite journalism. Um, now these were Arabic speaking journalists who let the mask slip in English. Uh, there are also more examples of it happening in Arabic, of course, and I can imagine many, many more examples uh, that don't get reported in. English at all. Um, Khaled, my question to you is, why do you think that these journalists, employed by major media institutions, feel so comfortable spouting this anti-Semitic rhetoric, seemingly without any real fear of the consequences? I mean, is it them or the culture they live in or grew up in? Is it the institutions or is it a combination? So I would definitely say it's a combination, sadly. Uh, I, I highlighted this in, in, in a paper that will be uh, published uh, quite soon uh, by a major Israeli publication. And sadly, we're just unequipped. We don't have the know-how here in the West to pretty much counter these, these efforts. And that is the main problem. We have decision makers who do not understand the dynamics of, of anti-Semitism, sadly, in an Arab community. And they do not understand the language, and they do not understand uh, Islamic teachings. So there is really so many challenges, and I think you need to have people who understand how this works. I'll mention one example of a very successful politician, uh, Nadim Zahari. I met him recently, a very successful politician, and a new friend I made, I hope, uh, who said something that really has a profound impact, I believe. He said, we need to make sure that anti-Semitism is culturally unacceptable. I think this is what we need to do everywhere, whether it's BBC Arabic, whether it's, you know, other uh, Arabic-speaking um, platforms, because sadly, you always see the distinction. I see the distinction. If you look at a news, a news platform, basically, and you see their Arabic service and their English service, there's a huge difference on how they report the very same uh, incident or development. A lot of people will tell you, well, yes, we have to present different perspectives. And I understand this, but obviously you do not have to normalize anti-Semitism as the other right. perspective. I think this is the challenge. Right. I'm wondering how this really like works on a, on a nationwide scale. For example, if there is someone who with anti-Semitic views in an Arabic speaking country, oh yeah, of course I believe these things, it's fine to say this. If there is someone with these views in the UK, how does uh, the, what is the effect of these journalists having on these people? Um, you know, in your estimation, are Arab and other foreign language media and religious preaching impacting immigrant communities in the UK? And if so, to what extent? Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So I'll, I'll, again, I'll give you a very personal example. So I miss Egypt. I miss Egypt very, very much because Egypt is my home. You know, it's where I grew up. Obviously, the UK is my home now, but it's, you know, to me, this idea of going home, you know, the, the fact that, you know, I grew up there in Egypt, it's just, it's a very emotional thing. So I always tend to, you know what, I'll just, you know, watch an Egyptian film, do this, do that. And sadly, you'll find a lot of immigrant communities, they have this bubble. So they watch their own shows. And they pretty much eat their own food. I eat a lot of Egyptian food myself. You know? So you end up living in this bubble. My wife is English. Uh, but a lot of people, they don't have the dynamic. So they don't really assimilate, which means that, you know, you, your household speaks Arabic most of the time. Your household watches Arabic films, watches Arabic shows, watches Arabic talk shows, and obviously uh, Arabic news uh, channels which means that you still live within this community with those imams, with this entirely, completely isolated bubble. 
So that has a huge impact on society. It, it's, it's, I mean, I am really quite, I'm not going to lie to you, I think I'm very disappointed in how consecutive governments have dealt with this. It's, it's, I believe it's been a failure. Uh, and sadly, that's again because a lot of people you see, and I have a lot of very good friends in the civil service, very senior uh, decision makers, and a lot of them do not even speak Arabic. Well, how can you understand the dynamics of what's happening if you don't speak the local language? Yeah. How can you dismantle these radical cells and how do you how do you pretty much counter radicalization and anti-Semitism in, in a British community if you do not understand this target community? Right. Right. That's interesting. I want to know, what is your view on, on the government's anti-radicalizing prevent program? So it's, uh, I just want to very briefly mention that I do not believe that there will be such a program that is completely flawless, basically. There will always be flaws, but I think we need to be objective. I think it hasn't been very successful for many reasons uh, on how actually to detect radicals at the very early stage because I think this is where you can succeed when you detect somebody showing these symptoms of radicalization how do you do this that's one of the key challenges so we've had incidents where you know teachers reported kids to <laughs> to, to, to to the program for saying something that actually isn't radical it's just you know they just misunderstood the context oh lord yes <laughs> and then you, and then you will have other incidents where some people should have been reported, but they were not reported by their own local community because to the local community, it is shameful to go and pretty much, you know, report somebody to the police or to the radicalization program. So they will never do this. We need to understand that local communities will never do this. So there are, you know, a number of factors that I think we need to bear in mind and we need to be really careful with these ideas. But sadly as well, there is always the accusations of Islamophobia. So whenever you talk about anti-radicalization, you also have Islamophobia. So I believe that the government generally really is also, you know, it's not entirely to blame. Just the whole environment itself, the ecosystem itself is really challenging in many ways. And I think that's why it needs communal efforts. Yeah, well, that, that's that's interesting. One of our previous guests on the podcast, Fayez Mughal, who's the founder of Muslims Against Antisemitism, um, he he warned of the rise of Islamism, citing groups like the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas um, as dangerous and influential terrorist organizations. Um, do you think that we need to be concerned about the rates of Islamism, or do you think that, as some claim, raising the alarm about Islamism is a cover for discriminating against innocent members of the Muslim community. Right, so that's actually a brilliant question because I completely agree with Faiz. It's, uh, it's, it's, I mean, I find it just shocking that nobody's talking about this in many ways. Uh, we need to understand that different communities seek influence. Let's admit this. This is not, nothing is, is, is especially wrong with this. So for instance, we Jews, we need to seek influence to make sure that, you know, our people are not targeted. So we need to influence decision making when it comes to countering radicalization, for instance. This is this is something we should actually aspire to. Uh, I mean, different communities have their different interests. And, you know, you always basically reach out to decision makers, hoping that you'll influence their decisions to your interests. You know, it's, it's a very natural and human aspect of life. Uh, sadly, Islamists do the same. But what they try to do is basically influence decision making into a direction that is favorable to Islamist ideas and to Islamist groups, which is very fundamentally against the values of this country. Uh, I have seen many experts and I have seen and no experts who have even given their own expert testimonies to Parliament on how the Muslim Brotherhood poses a serious threat to this country. Not, nothing has been done. The government will always refuse to designate them as a terrorist organization in any way, shape, or form. Uh, we, in fact, actually, I'll, I'll mention something else that I'm not sure a lot of you speakers will be aware of. We have, as the UK, a reputation, even in the Muslim world, of being very pro Islamists. Really? Yes. Because everyone, you have, you'll always have a lot of the very senior. Muslim Brotherhood figures, once they are targeted in Egypt, once they are basically persecuted, once they are, you know, 
pretty much, or even, you know, very legally and very reasonably held accountable for crimes that they have committed and terrorism, they always flee to different countries, including and especially the UK. So you'll find, for instance, a specific case, there is this um, broadcaster who's very well known for his very anti-Semitic views, and he supported Hamas very openly uh, from Turkey on YouTube, and he's been granted entry into the UK because Turkey said, you know what, we don't want this guy anymore because we want to just normalize relations in a way with Egypt and just basically uh, reach reconciliation, basically, with Egypt, a reconciliation agreement. The Egyptian government said, you need to pretty much kick this guy out. Turkey said, all right, we'll do it. We took him in the UK. And he's now based in London, promoting all these Islamist ideas and horribly uh, and blatantly supporting groups that we actually designate as terrorist groups under our laws. So the most recent example of, of a radicalized individual that I can think of who was raised in the UK, who was from the UK and then went abroad was Malik Faisal Akram, who was the hostage taker at the Colleyville Synagogue. He held the rabbi and his congregants hostage for about 11 hours, I believe. Um, and he was demanding the release of Aifa Siddiqui, who yes. is another terrorist. And uh, I was absolutely shocked that this uh, this man was from Blackburn. Yes. it's uh, The challenge is you always see... So I'll tell you something again that is from my own personal experience. So I worked in different places with many different people across the UK, lived in different places in the UK. Um, and you always see that some people who grow up in a community where your mom and dad are the immigrants. They are the Muslim, or basically Muslims who do not really speak a lot of English, and this kind of environment. And then they basically raise you up, believing their own convictions, which sadly in many cases include, includes anti-Semitism and a lot of very anti-Jew uh, sentiments. And that's what happens. You get people like him who just go around and just obviously he is a very extreme, a very extreme example. But many other examples, I've always had people just like him reach out to me at work and think that because of my name, you know, I'm a Muslim and I'm just like them and I'm normal. And uh, they reach out to me with comments like, you know what, be careful, Khalid. Jews control this country. Be careful, you know, things like this. I get this, these comments all the time from people who do not obviously know, you know, who I am or what I do now. Uh, and they just make these, these comments knowing or actually expecting that I would be completely fine because this is how everyone from my background should be with these ideas. Uh, again, this is something that I really think we need to focus on. Right, right. I, I think one of the most shocking um, recent instances of, of domestic anti-Semitism that was everyone heard about um, occurred in May of last year, when a convoy of cars uh, drove through a Jewish neighborhood in London shouting, um, F the Jews, rape their daughters through megaphones. Um, this went viral. Uh, and it was horrible. It was it was absolutely horrible. And I, I, I know that um, you were also appalled by this. You published an article on it shortly after it occurred. Um, and, and you wrote that you thought that you had escaped this sort of behavior when you left the Middle East. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about that. Yes, it was actually especially shocking for us because my wife is not Jewish. So my wife is, you know, a very normal English middle class woman, uh, which also means that she's slightly an atheist or not sure. <laughs> so, you know, uh, but we're raising our daughter as Jewish. And my daughter was, you know, a very young baby then. And just to hear this was really, really horrific. And this was the very first time since moving to the UK in early 2016, that I actually thought my life or the life of somebody that I love might be directly threatened by Islamists, which is, you know, this is normal in, in, in a country like Egypt. You know, I was threatened by the Muslim Brotherhood because I was very actively involved in pretty much ousting the president, the Muslim Brotherhood president, and I was very outspoken against them. But I knew the risks. Here in the UK, this was completely unprecedented. The fact that this happens on our streets and it was traumatized. Yeah, it, it was. Um, how are we seeing this in 2022? How is this still happening? 2021, sorry. 
Yeah, it, it, it was, I mean, it was traumatizing on many levels because also you have to understand a lot of, a lot of Jews, our daughters might be disabled. Our daughters might be vulnerable somehow. Our daughters, you know, our, and obviously, because also just to mention one thing, something else, people from this background, in many cases, look at things in a way of shame and honor. So threatening somebody, a parent, that you will rape their daughters is probably one of the worst and most horrific things that you can threaten somebody to do. You know, this is, this is, I mean, if you say we're going to have another Holocaust, we've had this before, you know, all right, we're, you know, Hitler should have finished you all off. We've had this before. But to say something like this, this is from their own perspective, the worst that they can do to us. To say we're going to rape your daughters, this is, you know, this it doesn't get worse than this. Again, in this context, mm. yeah, it, it was it was vile. Um, now, now, if someone approaches you and says, Khaled, I would like to help in the fight against anti-Semitism, what advice would you give them? I would definitely say we need to do uh, what Nadim Zahawi said in one sentence. We need to make sure that it is culturally unacceptable. Again, we're failing really here. We're failing on campuses. I mean, I am absolutely delighted that they did take the decision, uh, did make the decision to actually pretty much the government cut ties with uh, the NUS. That was really a welcome development. And the name of Harry again was absolutely brilliant in, in contributing to this. But this is what we need. It's this, this decision is wonderful by the government. The government really cannot do much more, but we still need to make it culturally unacceptable. This is not where we're going. It's still very much culturally acceptable in many circles. So that's what I would say. Just understand your target audience and please help us make this culturally unacceptable. Talk about it. Right. Yeah, I think that's good advice. Now, um, as, as we draw to a close, uh, where can people find you and what have you got coming up? Yes, so uh, I've, I've written an article recently, it will be published by Jerusalem Post, so it will actually address the developments around the Lady of Heaven and again challenging extremists. Uh, you can always reach out to me on Twitter, uh, and I am helping in any way, shape or form basically to combat them. So it's Khaled, so K-H-A-L-E-D-H, Zakaria, uh, Z-A-K-A-R-I-A-H. Uh, and you can always reach out to me. All right. Khaled, uh, you know, thank you for all the work you're doing. I've really enjoyed this conversation. And thank you for coming on Podcast Against Antisemitism. No, thank you for your time. And thank you for all the wonderful work you do. And uh, I'm, I'm just delighted I had the chance to talk to you. And hopefully we'll definitely stay in touch and combat anti-Semitism together. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs>